Welcome to the Power Cat Podcast, presented by Fridge Wholesale Liquor. Now let's go to the Rolling Flint Hills, home of the Cats and Dogs Studio. Here's your host, Tim Fitzgerald. Welcome to another edition of the Power Cat Podcast. Tim Fitzgerald and Zach Carlson here in the Cats and Dogs Studio. And Ryan Gilbert with his upgraded internet connection right there in his expansive, expansive, beautiful and, Aggie and upgraded suite. phone and an upgraded phone, which has nothing to do with this podcast, but he likes to tell everyone because yeah. he was uh, prior, he was on a uh, telegraph service. I mean, it was an Apple, what a negative three what model was it? It was like an iPod nano pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With a shattered screen and it kind of, yeah. it reflected his hopes and dreams. But yeah, now he's upgraded. Phone. Yeah, new is, phone, new Wi-Fi connection. We're going to be great. Is this like a 15? Like a full-fledged new phone? I got a 14. Okay, that's smart. That's a smart consumer move. Miles better than what I had. <laughs> well, yeah. Freaking cup and string would have been better. We're sponsored <laughs> by The Fridge. You know what? They might have the cup and string right there. If you're going to have a party involving cups and string, I'm not sure on the string, but replace that with... Uh, alcohol so cups and alcohol there you go you got a party you can get your ice at outside the store it's amazing need some mix not if you're drinking bourbon <clears throat> don't don't do it don't know but if you need some mix for other things you can get it at the fridge the fridge wholesale liquor has been a long time sponsor of this show we appreciate it we love them and i don't just talk about them because they pay me to I talk about them because I absolutely love the people there, the store, everything about it. <clears throat> it's a way you should do local business. And why can't I clear my throat, Zach? What's going on? You need to fill in and host for the rest of the show? <clears throat> Man. Need some water. I need well, I don't yeah. know. I don't know what's going on. Uh everyone's feeling a little uh under the weather. Uh gills for more understandable reasons. Zach. Are you, you feeling, hold on, Zach, you feeling okay? Uh, the allergies, but allergies. Yeah. 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 And that's probably what's going on with me, but we had a long night with the Deuteronomy last night. He had another one of his seizures. Um, so, uh, I've got some requests for the dog cam, the studio cam to be on, but I'm having camera issues that I can't exactly do that right now. Uh, my cameras have decided despite having the settings off that they're going to have their settings together whatever i do to my camera does that camera and screwed it up so i can't i'm sorry i'm sorry for all the dude and daphne fans that watch this simply because of the dogs and gilbert i'm gilbert's part of the dogs uh, i apologize <sighs> zach how's our questions today it was uh, kind of a short window for people it was to a short window i actually thought they were pretty decent oh but we pretty much used every question <laughs> what are we going to start with uh, basketball and then mm -hmm. some more basketball and a little bit of football to close us out. Okay, so we're going to do basketball break, basketball, football. Yes. Okay. That is what we're doing. Uh, this is called production. <laughs> Stuff you should do before the cameras <laughs> and mics are going. <clears throat> but do we think that far ahead? No. And hopefully no. my voice clears as we go. It's your questions from Wabash Station. If you don't know how it works, we appreciate you joining us for the first time. Everyone gets to listen and now watch. But if you want to ask the questions, you have to be a member at Wabash Station. And hint, hint, there might just be a sale coming on Wednesday. If you'd like to join the party at gopowercat.com and across the 24-7 network, it's postseason fun time. And so starting on Wednesday, it'll be 50% off. I don't know if I'm supposed to share what the actual sale was before the sale. It's probably fine. What if I get beaten up? By like someone from Nashville shows up and goes, "Hey, quit sharing our specials." I don't know why they have a hitman. Well, let's get going here. Questions from Wabash Station. Zach Carlson, reader extraordinaire, has the duties. From El Camino Cat, Tyler Perry is twenty-eight points and six rebounds away from becoming the fourth Wildcat to have five hundred points, one hundred rebounds, and one hundred assists in a season. Joining Mitch Richmond, Barry Brown, and Marquise Noel. Is his play underappreciated this season? First of all, uh, was that in the notes package? El Camino, how did you find that? It was that some, I, it's probably in the notes that I don't read, but that's an amazing stat. Gills, that's an amazing stat. 
I would have never guessed that because of his scoring slumps this season. But, you know, even in some of the games he struggled the most, you look at the stats at the end of the game and go, he had 18 points because he just pours it on. That is incredible company if he joins it. And I think it puts a different context to what he's accomplished this season. I, I, I used to think this was a Tyler Perry issue. You know, it's not really his fault, the issue here. He's not a point guard. He's trying to do something he's not equipped to do. Um, it's the issues lie elsewhere. I mean, the fact that they don't have a point guard is an issue, but it's not Tyler Perry's fault. Yeah. I mean, you look at Mitch Richmond, obviously did some good things in the Wildcat uniform, right? Barry Brown yeah. won a conference title. Yeah. Marquise Noel goes to the Elite Eight. And then, you know, it's that it's kind of like the Justin Edwards situation. I think he is such an underappreciated K State basketball player. Because just he was a great player, but he was on teams that were not good they were terrible teams um that was right after the the program kind of got torpedoed for a little bit when marcus foster left and so i'm not going to say tyler perry is not going to be remembered or appreciated but my real answer here would be tyler perry has come a long way this season that's probably the best way to put it early on i think he was struggling at times he was maybe too assertive trying too hard taking too many shots and then you know also there was a, a time where perry was being too passive and not taking enough chances. And so I think the the blend has, you know, Tyler Perry started to find his his groove. Obviously the last, what is it, the last two games, he hasn't really been a factor at all to, to close out the regular season, but that's probably more of just the opponents honing in on him defensively and making somebody else beat them. And when Cam Carter's in a slump and Arthur Kluma maybe isn't able to step up, things get exaggerated a little bit more when you lose, you know, by 22 points inside of Allen Fieldhouse. But you know, Tyler Perry's come a long way, and I was very critical of him on this show. And, you know, early on in the year, he's holding the ball for 20 seconds in a shot clock and throwing up a prayer. Like, we saw that way too many times, guys. We could all agree on that, right? Yeah. But he's been he's been huge, right? K-State probably doesn't beat KU at home without him. You know, Villanova, he had that late shot, right? He stepped up, you know, through the latter portions of Big 12 play, so you got to give credit where it's due. And so I, I'll say it again. He came a long way this season. Um, I don't know if – I mean, again – if K-State can get hot in the Big 12 tournament and sneak into the NCAA tournament, that's probably going to change the outlook on what we view Tyler Perry as in Can you know, at Kansas State. Now, for right or wrong, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, that's just kind of how it naturally is. If you're not on a team that goes to that that makes the NCAA tournament, you know, if Tyler if this team doesn't go, you know, it's going to be tough for him to be remembered as a, as a K-State re legend. And I'm not that's not a knock on him. That's just kind of how it's going to be because if you don't if you don't do you know. If you don't do special things, you know, quote unquote, it's going to be hard to be remembered like Noel or Brown, regardless of if you have similar stats to them. True. The stat line for a, a whole season over the 31 games, it's basically 15 points a game, three rebounds, three assists is what you need to do to be 500, 100, 100. It sounds like Gills could do that. Like <laughs> it. I don't want to That's say not it's not a real high bar. I don't want to say it's easy, but like. 15 points, three rebounds, three assists a game. Like, that is, I think it says more about what K-State basketball was between Mitch Richmond and Barry Brown than it does about Tyler Perry. Um, you know, that this will be three and six years, uh, six seasons, I think, is what it would be. So I, I think it's more, you're going to see more of these players each year. I think each K-State team is going to have a guy flirting in that 500 100 100 range like Tyler Perry is right now. I think it's just what basketball is becoming. You need to do a little bit of everything. You need to score obviously, but you know, getting 3 assists isn't terribly difficult. Getting 3 rebounds is probably pretty easy. <clears throat> um, you know, I just I don't want to say it's not an impressive stat line because, you know, obviously It'd be limited company, but on the other hand, I think it just says more about K-State probably should have had a lot more than three players right now on the list. I would agree with that. I can't believe Marquise. I mean, that's Marquise Noel always talked about hard over height, right? Like yeah. a guy as short as him to grab three rebounds a game is not easy. So that's just a testament. <laughs> but to his, but it is system. like when, you know. That's a, for a, a guy of, that size, for a point guard, for any guard, that's a hustle stat because that ball's coming sure. down to the ground. Yeah, but also I think it says a lot about the way basketball's played. You throw a shot up, everybody goes back on defense, you know, and the big guys, you know, clear out of the way. I think it's just a matter of Marquise knowing where to 
put his body to grab the ball, uh, especially like especially uh, like how many of those rebounds are just completely uncontested. Right. You know, like I think that there's a lot more. I would say more than half of those rebounds. He didn't have to fight anybody. It was just grabbing the ball because right. it was available there. So, you know, I don't want to knock the stat, but K-State probably should have more than three guys. It, it is an interesting company, though. It really yes. is. You, I wouldn't group him without those stats with the, that group of guys. I'd never, ever. But here we are. From Gillum Fan 67663, the word seems to be the Cats need two wins in KC to be a tournament team. Gillum fan thinks a win against Texas will be enough. Do you see it happening, or is he wishing too much? Gills, I, I did that deep purple with the blind resumes, and I got to admit I don't understand why Kansas State is so distant compared to some other programs. I, I don't I don't get it. Um, I, I really don't understand how Cincinnati's net ranking is 30 points higher, at least at the time I shot the video, than Kansas State's. I, I really can't wrap my mind around it because, uh, look, they've got a lot of quad two losses. Cincinnati has some quad three and four losses. Cincinnati has a worse record against winning percentage against quad one opponents. They've, they've played a lot more quad one opponents, but they've lost to them. They're three and 10 in that quad. Um, and I, look, I know they're out of the tournament too, but the 30 point difference in a net ranking just doesn't add up to me. So there's some factors in there. I don't quite grasp. And again, as we pointed out, um, Villanova isn't what we thought they'd be, although their net is pretty decent. Uh, Nebraska turned out to be much better than what we thought. Um, but losing to the likes of Miami and USC teams that have fallen off the table has hurt their ranking, but they're still quad two teams. I, I, I mean, I, I can't add this up. Uh, so a sense, a part of me feels the same way that they might be closer. We don't know what the committee's thinking. We try to pretend like we do, but they might be closer than we expect. But I think the win over Texas on Wednesday would get them on the bubble, the wrong side of the bubble. And by that, I mean, you might be the, not the next four out or the first four out. You might be in the next four out. I mean, you're going to be in the conversation. Just nobody's really talking about you, but beating Iowa state again, I think that gets them in emphatically. In fact, I think back-to-back -back wins over a top 10 team within three, a three game window uh, might skip you right over Dayton and into the main bracket. I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think we're all just grasping. And as part of what's fun about this time of year is trying to decide these things. We know this, they got to win in Kansas city, win as much as you can. And if they come home after playing one game, <clears throat> well, I, I think they're going to be in the NIT. I don't know if they're going to host a game, but they're going to be in the NIT. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, I mean, you said it best fits. I think that the, the biggest thing is, the non-conference for Kansas State. That's what, in turn, makes the net rating so poor, right? You look at, obviously, the lack of quality opponents on there, or quality wins, whatever, but the strength of schedule in the non-conference is just awful. And so it was not only that, though, is that K-State didn't blow out its, you know, all of its crappy opponents on the schedule, right. so to speak, right? You know, a win by one point is different than a win by 15 points, right? It gets capped. It doesn't matter if you win by 15 or 35, but 15 is like, you know, you got to get to 15 points, right? And that's, you know, like the best win, I'm, you know, for lack of a better term, with, with the net ratings, right? And I think with Cincinnati, those, the offensive and defensive efficiency numbers, like it's those sorts of things where K State, again, that's, this is maybe above our knowledge level fits, but, you know, that's why Kansas State's net rating is poor. And that's probably why K State's not being considered. But you do look at, you know, the quality wins that Kansas State has, right? There's no quadrant three and four losses, right? You look at just that that aspect of the resume, it's great. And so how much do we want to trust Joe Lenardi and Jerry Palm and all these bracketologists, right? Are they being spoon fed this information to not even include Kansas State? Or are they wrong? Does the committee see things differently? If you're Jerome Tang and if you're a K-State fan hoping to sneak into the tournament, you hope that it's the latter, that that's the, the committee doesn't see eye to eye with with uh with those bracketologists, right? Now you win eight games in the regular season in the Big 12. You go win nine, ten, right? You get a couple in Kansas City. I mean, Tyler Perry said it best before the Iowa State game. 
uh, leading up to that one that you put the committee into a tough spot. I think that that's what you should want. I mean, I don't know if one wins gets you in two win. I mean, guys, if, if Kansas State truly isn't on the bubble right now, I don't know how two wins uh, in the committee's eyes, right? If they're not even in consideration right now, I don't know how two wins would get you over the hump, right? Now, if 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 they're as close as Tang kind of thinks that they are, absolutely, I think two would. I know Tang, Fitz, you asked him after the Iowa State game, right? How many do you, yep. you know, what's the goal here? And he said two. And then I, I, I yesterday or on Monday, right, I asked him, you know, what's kind of the, the mindset going into a, a tournament where you have been outspoken about needing to win more than one game? You know, how do you lock in on one? And he kind of answered the question as well. Hey, you know, I don't know who's been outspoken about it, right? Get one, and I think you're in a good spot to win nine games in the Big 12. And he went on to explain some things again with the resume and stuff. So, um, you know, they Kansas State believes that they're in probably a much better spot than the bracketologists and all that stuff would suggest. Now, I don't know if they're correct or not, but I know that Jerome Tang is is pretty confident about the resume that, that his team has right now. Yeah, I think you have to win too. I don't think that a win against Texas is going to be enough. I don't I either. I think it'll make you show up on the TV set as a team that didn't make the field. <laughs> I mean, that'll yeah. be the best you get out of that. Uh, they just didn't get enough done in the regular season. But the irony, of course, is uh, this is the most competitive conference. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt. Most knowledgeable people agree with that. Um, but Oklahoma is solidly in the field at 8-10 and 10 in the conference. Uh, so, you know, I, I think Jerome Tang was zeroed in on that. 9-9 mm-hmm. nine nine does get you in. Uh, but they didn't get to nine and nine of their own doing. They had an opportunity at Cincinnati. They didn't play as well as they should have. The Bearcats played extremely well in that game, but that was the missed opportunity, and we knew it when it happened. I think with uh, this probably was after I recorded with Clint Stewart. I think we were just kind of <clears throat> shooting it after we recorded, but he was talking about Fitz. He was at 07 when they missed when they missed the NCAA yeah, tournament, and they the completely yeah. should have been in right. Oh, it was um, absurd. Yeah. There were 10 but and 6 in the conference. If you win one more game in Kansas City, then maybe you do get in, right? So even if Jerome Tank thinks that one gets them in or two, why not get three? You know, get yourself where yeah. there is no debate to be made for that committee. You lock yourself in there or heck, just go win the conference tournament, which automatically gets you in. I saw a great bracket. Um, Drake Toll from Locked On Big 12 did a, a, a bracket. And the bracket, uh, was designed what's best for the Big 12. That was TCU and Kansas State playing in the championship game and Cincinnati advancing all the way to the semifinals. It basically ensured 12 schools for the Big 12 would be in based on what every team seems to need. Uh, but, of course, they'll be competing against each other if they all up their resume so much. It, yeah. it was interesting, though, because uh, the, you, you don't know how Houston's going to respond to this environment. Kansas is going to be greatly diminished. I, I, mm-hmm. I, I almost admire Bill Self. He just said, you know what? I got two dudes I got to have next week to do anything. We're, we don't care about Kansas City. We're the sixth seed. We're just shutting it down. We're in the field. Uh, we're going to try to get our, our key guys healthy because without them, we're not doing anything in the tournament. So they're useless. You can just – you might as well take them off that side of the bracket. Um, and uh, we'll see what shakes out. But there's some opportunity here. But – to, to do anything, Casey's got to win this one. Next question is from Call Me T22. What is the best item on the Big 12 tournament menu? Also, should we be insulted that the Big 12 literally gave K State a turnover as our menu item? <laughs> oh, crap, they did. <laughs> yeah, I think calling it a turnover is a compliment to the Big 12. They gave K State an uncrustable and fried it. That's all it is. It's an uncrustable. It's not a turnover. It's an uncrustable. That's bloody bad. And it, I look. I, I, I don't consume the items. I'm not interested in the items. I, I looked at K State's because I can't remember what last year's was, but it was trash. Everyone said it was trash. I think it was still worse, <laughs> but they made an improvement. But so I don't know, Zach. Have you even looked at the menu? Yeah, I did. I pulled it up a minute ago. I don't know, man. Yeah, you got the Big Twelve dog. Which Who gets is, that? Just the whole. That's conference? just the whole conference gets a hot dog with a bunch of extra stuff and some nuclear yellow uh, nacho cheese and oh. then Baylor brisket sliders that's not, what? those are fine that's not Cosmos that. churros for BYU 
Hold fun. on, he gets churros. He gets churros. What's Utah got to do with churros? I think you will enjoy this: the Citronaut drink. Oh, I did enjoy that. Uh, it's like an orange soda and vanilla ice cream thing. Looks pretty cool. Uh, that vodka. Uh, Cincinnati obviously got the Cincy cheese coney. So there's chili and cheese and onions on that hot dog. I think they should put noodles on it. Should, it should just be a bowl of spaghetti and chili. Just, I I think they should actually. I I don't mind that actually. Throw some noodles on that damn thing. <laughs> Have the three way dog. Oh boy. That, uh, oh, we way, got through right here, called. right? Yeah. Houston has Shasta's brisket tacos. So they're reusing the brisket there for some tacos. That's good. That's fine. Iowa State, uh, they have the Dorito bag walking taco. That's perfect for them. That is their thing. Yep. Get a bush uh, like that. KU, Big J's loaded mac and cheese. Of course, uh, KU would get something delicious. No Bill Self <laughs> mac and cheese, though, if we're there. Right, it's Zach? got, no, the mac and cheese looks terrible. There is barbecue sauce, pulled pork, uh, probably the nuclear yellow cheese sauce, and then some pasta. This, it looks terrible. Uh, yeah. K State is the Power Cat PB and J. It literally looks like an uncrustable on wheat bread that was fried and got some powdered sugar on it. It looks awful. OU is the Oklahoma Onion Burger. Looks like just the generic burger with oh, a yes. a slice, an unmelted slice of a craft single with some like funyun looking things on it. Oklahoma State is the orange power pizza. What? Probably some sort of hideaway thing is my guess is what they're trying to take. It's okay. like a meat lover's pizza. Mm. Uh, the Cowtown Loaded Tots has tots with a bunch of stuff on it for TCU. Okay. And the sour cream is purple. There's purple sour cream. Uh, the Big Bertha Loaded Baked Potato is Texas. So that's kind of funny. They get a baked potato. Who's going to a, a basketball game and ordering a baked potato? That is funny. Why wouldn't they get something beef related? You can literally eat their mascot. I mean, there is brisket on the baked potato. Their mascot, if it wasn't old and probably stringy, would be delicious. But that's true for all of us. Go ahead. Uh, the Masked Rider Burger is Texas Tech. It looks, it looks like a... It's got jalapenos and an onion ring on it and the same unmelted slice of American cheese. Okay. And then West Virginia gets the Mountaineer pepperoni roll, which I saw a picture of this weekend and did not look very good. Okay, here's here, here's a rant. I didn't think I'd have a rant about uh, concession foods, um, but I am sensing, as I look, look deep into this camera, a vast conspiracy against kansas state having delicious food i don't remember what it was last year but trash and now as zach has correctly pointed out this is an uncrustable fried like don't call it a turnover that's bread people are getting <laughs> hot dogs nachos burgers uh pepperoni rolls i mean tacos sliders here's a pb and j with no crust on it. It's all fancied up, and we're going to fry it. Like, most of the foods look fine for, you know, for each team. Mm. Oh, K-State last year, the K-State Wabash Cannon Dog was a bacon-wrapped jumbo hot dog topped with wildcat purple relish. Oh, and it was... It That's was, what it was. It was the purple said, relish, and it was... The relish was awful. It was terrible. Why don't, why don't I try something different within that? Say, I don't think there's anything wrong with a bacon-wrapped dog. That's a good base. That's a foundational thing there. You got your point guard. And, and then uh, they add the purple slot. You're a very loud, a loud drinker. You're very loud. I, just, I don't like how I West Virginia. I bet you do after last night. I don't like how teams like West Virginia get their thing. Like Morgantown is pepperoni roll yeah, central. That makes sense. Like why can't. Well, one, why can't Manhattan have their own cool thing? Two, why can't the cool thing be the grilled cheese mac and cheese? That's what this should be. If we're going to use all those craft singles, let's melt them onto some pieces of bread that and take the KU mac and cheese and put it between those slices. Somebody in the Big 12 office needs to learn and become cultured. And let's just name it um, 
the varsity mac and cheese and yeah, grilled mac and cheese. It's it's actually yeah. something fans will know from 2 a.m. in Aggieville. And it'd probably be better. It would, it would definitely be better. Look, I, I know everyone's conspiring against Kansas State. First, it's the road construction. And now it's the delicious foods being served at the Big 12 tournament. I see you, evil forces. Okay, I'm done. Yeah. Next question is from KSU Man. Is there a chance the Big 12 tourney moves out of Kansas City in the near future? Near? No. Near? No. They, they've got a contract in place for I don't know how many years now. but um, So the, all the new schools, including the ones coming in next year, I think we'll have at least two years in Kansas City. I think it's through 27. I think. So this is 24. Okay. Well, three years. I then. think. I think you're right. I'm, I'm totally spacing off because my yeah. memory's trash. Also, uh, the commissioner's having a press conference Tuesday evening with the mayor of Kansas City and some other important leaders in the area, which makes it seem like maybe they're announcing something. Also, one of them is the president of the KC Current, so maybe they're going to announce that the women's soccer tournament will be played at the new stadium that they're opening up this weekend. Um, which would be significant since it's yeah. the first stadium built exclusively for women's sports like that. Yes. Professional. Um, so very cool thing. That's that's my speculation anyway, but you know, who knows? Maybe they announce an extension. But I think after last year, you know, before before Brett Yormark had a full year on the job, you know, he was, you know, probably considering, yeah, we can take this to New York, Brooklyn, Vegas, wherever. You know, and we can have a great tournament, but he hadn't experienced a Kansas City tournament, right. which a lot of us were saying, just wait. And I think after last year, he saw it. I think he understands it. I don't think there's any way in his head that he's thinking about moving this tournament anytime soon. I would agree. I I mean, uh, this has been the same message I've had for the current expansion schools, Cincinnati, um, you know, BYU. Look, just give it a shot. I mean, you're already talking about moving it and you haven't experienced it. Now, I know Kansas City's not on your vacation plans list. I, I, I get that. Um, I mean, for Iowa State fans, it is Cancun. But uh, maybe it's more Cabo. I don't know. But uh, something about the Big 12 tournament in Kansas City meshes into this amazing thing. It, it really is a vibe. Uh, it's the most important thing. And when you're down in the heart of Kansas City at the many hotel rooms, rates have come down, it looks like, because there's so many rooms now with the new, what is the new one, Lowe's? Lowe's. Yeah, you could do home repairs and sleep over. It's really cool. I think cool. the E and the W are misplaced oh. on that version. I get so confused. But uh, it's it's really cool. And I understand now with the new group coming in next year, they're all Western, and they would love it to be in Vegas. Look, you're talking to a dude that would move everything to Vegas if he could. Uh, but I I do hope they give Kansas City a shot because there's something about being the biggest the biggest show in town, uh, having it really important. Everyone knows. Everyone's talking about it. You're amongst – when you're down in downtown Kansas City over the next four or five days, everyone will know what's going on. You can stop people on the street. There might be some residents who don't care and just talk about big 12 hoops. Uh, every cab you get in, they'll know what's going on. It's amazing. Um, and uh, I hope it doesn't move, but I can see a push to move it to Vegas, but I think Zach's right. Gills. I, I think Brett Yormark saw it last year. He, he saw the demand for those courtside tickets that, you know, they, they moved the media up above and sold those seats, which financially is brilliant. And he's realizing because of the costs of staging the event are lower in Kansas City and they're selling out, what is T-Mobile's capacity? It's like 18. 18, almost 20K. So, I wouldn't say it's almost 20, but, but you, you know, you, yeah. Uh, it the, the profit for the conference has to be much higher than moving it to a more expensive venue. Uh, and we'll see, but I don't think it's going anywhere. Yeah. If, as long as Brett Yormark goes every year, you know, you walk around PL, you know, you, you see how excited fans are. There's, he would be insane to, to move it anywhere else. Right. Uh, I'm looking for, I hope Cincinnati, UCF, uh, Houston, and BYU fans are coming to town. Some. It just takes the right fans that come and that are socially 
active on social media um, and to spread the word, this was spectacular because it is. Uh, it's it's a whole thing. It, this is Kansas City is Big 12 Tournament City for the next week. According to Wikipedia, for basketball, it is 18,972. So it's Good basically 19,000 for, for basketball. Uh, one thing I will say, though, if they're going to move it anywhere, you got to think Oklahoma City might be a candidate. I know OU's leaving the conference, but those Oklahoma City tournaments that they did for a couple of years, they were pretty decent, they were. and it's and Oklahoma City's centrally located with the footprint with the footprint of the conference even into the future. They're going to build a brand new arena in Oklahoma City, and it's going to have the fifth highest skyscraper in the world. Oklahoma City's going to have the fifth highest skyscraper in the world. Yes, the tallest building in America. The funding apparently is all there. It's going to be built next to the Thunder's new arena near Bricktown. Are the Emirates pissed? I bet you they are. Probably are. I mean, uh, still not. What do they think they are? Dubai? (laughs) What's going on here? Hey, that's what they that's what they call Oklahoma City. It's the Dubai of the Midwest. Wow. So let me get this right. Um, Oklahoma joins the SEC, and now their their urban neighbor, I guess, becomes a big deal. Huh. Huh. Yeah. I see it. I'm connecting the dots now. It's all the SEC. They're trying to build up that TV market. Yeah, they are. Last question of the first half, though, from I Like Pickles Cat. Who has underperformed more so far, the men or women? Oh, the men. I mean, look, uh, I think some of you have gone whacked with your women's takes. Uh, the Big 12, the, the, the top six or so in the Big 12 are really good. I mean, that was a number five ranked team last night that they lost to. Uh, and are they better? You know what? They are better than K-State. Uh, overall, they're just bigger and fit more physical. Um, I'm going to say something. Some of you might not agree with They're They're more poorly coached. I mean, I, I, I just think he literally rolls the ball out there and says, go play. Uh, but, uh, they, they just haven't found the groove post injury for a, Aoka Lee. And, um, I feel like they're getting closer. I felt like as that game went on, the loss to Texas in the semifinals, they started to look a little bit more like themselves. So uh, I'm I'm hopeful when they get out of Big 12 play, where everyone knows you, there could be a real problem for teams. Uh, but uh, look, I mean, Texas was just better. They're fifth ranked. There's a reason why uh, K-State has lost two out of three to them. But one of them was out without Yoki, and one was a win. So uh, I think what we saw yesterday is K-State can compete at the highest levels. So I just let them get to the tournament before you declare them dead. I, the, this is a talented women's team, but I think in some ways they overachieved early in the year, but I, th- I th- also think they could end up you know, going deep in this tournament. We'll, we'll find out, but I, I think, we're seeing a lot of overreaction from losing to a really good Texas team. What was the true Kansas State women's team? So they started off 20 and 1, 9 and 0 in the Big 12, right? Since then, they've obviously gone basically like 500 to close out the season. So, I mean, which which team was the true Kansas State women's team, right? Now, obviously, losing Oakley, that's huge. You know, even if she's not 100% healthy, you know, that, that's, that's big. But it also depends on, you know, are we basing this off of the preseason expectations? Right. You know, was this when Naquan Tomlin was still supposed to be a, a player for this team? Or are we basing it off of just what's gone on between the, you know, the, between the sidelines? Sorry, the, the stripes? Between yeah, the, okay. Uh, yeah. You know, but oh, what's gotcha. happened? On, on the, the hardwood? Court, on the hardwood, sure. What's actually happened? You know, I don't I mean, it's tough. That's a, It's a good question. I don't think there's a necessarily a right or wrong answer. Fitz, I think you, you outlined some good things, but it kind of depends – um, you know, could Tyler Perry have been better early on in the year, right? You know, could Arthur Kluma maybe been more consistent? You know, Cam Carter, could he not have had this slump? And you can say the same things about the women, right? But, I mean, if Kansas State has Quez Glover and Naquan Tomlin, are we going to factor that into this, you know, underperforming, right? I think Kansas State ba- men's basketball and women's too with Aoka Lee's injury, but men specifically has just had so many obstacles, you know, that have been thrown at them that, 
really have been kind of out of their control, right? You know, like even with the non-conference, you know, USC and Miami, like you did not expect those teams to be awful at this time of the year, right? You didn't expect Naquan Tomlin to get dismissed from the team, right? So there was just a lot of things that were thrown at this team. Um, and that's, that can be said for the women as well. So uh, obviously, I, I, you know, both have underperformed, but for a variety of reasons. Yeah, for for me, the question is, have the women underperformed since the preseason, since October, or have they underperformed since the Iowa game or since the beginning of February? You know, there's a lot of goalposts that get moved as yeah. you have success. And K-State was really successful early in the season, um, but they were definitely overperforming expectations. Um, they were good. They were exciting to watch. Still good and still exciting to watch. But, um, you know, beating Iowa kind of, you know, gave them a bump in in expectations, you know, whether you like it or not. And um, since then, you know, with Aoka Lee's injury, um, you know, it's a little frustrating watching them and, and you know, seeing what they were early in the season, but they kind of came back down to earth a little bit. But on the other hand, for the men, I think that that's really the true answer because, you know, even still throughout the non-con, you shouldn't have been going to overtime against the three teams you went consecutively. Um, you shouldn't have, you know, lost to Nebraska at home. You know, I we can look at the Big 12 schedule all we want and look at, you know, they went 8-10. and 10. If they go 9-9, nine and nine, they're in the tournament. I think if you beat Nebraska, you're in the tournament or you beat somebody else by more points, you're probably in the tournament, but you didn't. And and I think that Fair. that's where the underperformance is. And and that's the reality that, that we're talking about here. That's it for the first half of the Power Cat podcast. As mentioned, we're sponsored by Fridge Wholesale Liquor. I hope you're going to make it to Kansas City. These two guys will be. I'll be here in the studio all weekend. My guy brian hanley and i might do some lives on the new big 12 insiders channel and and do some content there but these guys have it uh, so if k-state's there for one game two games three games seven games if they just start if they win the tournament and then just start playing local teams just to prove they're badass these guys will be there that's how we roll we'll be back after this break and a message from the fridge and whoever else at youtube and our podcast platforms want to put in here it could be really cool maybe there's going to be like a an ad for uh getting rid of uh annoying uh guys named ryan gilbert i don't i don't know we'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors please visit the fridge wholesale liquor located at the corner of claflin and westport road in manhattan kansas Welcome back to the show. Let's return to the Cats and Dogs studio. Welcome back to the Power Cat Podcast, sponsored by Fridge Wholesale Liquor. Fitz and Zach and Gills, all with Z's in our name. Huh, I wonder if that was a coincidence. Coincidence or plan? No, we planned that, definitely. Uh, uh, that's how Gills became Gills. We required him to have a Z. I hope you're having a great week because it's going to be a great week. It's beautiful weather. Zach, usually the tournament doesn't get this weather. No, usually it's very cold. Uh, and I I haven't been jealous of not going, like envious. Uh, but now that I saw the weather, oh, my God, P&L is going to be out of control. I, I mean, if K-State loses for four straight nights, Ryan Gilbert would be down there without a shirt on, uh, letting everyone autograph his chest. Yeah. Gross. By the way, uh, looking at Lenardi's uh, projections here at the very bottom – he has kind of a, a win and in, you're out without a win, win here, win again. Casey, it is in the win here, then win again. So he believes that if you beat Texas and then you beat you know, whoever the next night, Iowa you're State. Iowa State, you are in, according to Lenardi. At least wow. that's his current thermometer. But it's always good thermometer. to uh, check with Joe Lenardi's uh, site <clears throat> on Sunday. When, when everything he, gets leaked. Yeah, when he starts getting things leaked to him and all of a sudden – uh, Stanford, like one year, went from nowhere even mentioned to uh, like a 10 seed because he had so <laughs> screwed them up all year. Although I think he was right and the committee wasn't. Um, just you see these miracle movements that have no explanation. Well, he got the information leaked to him. Sounds like K-State's overdue for that. 
maybe. <clears throat> yeah. It's, uh, you know, you mentioned that that team that Clint was on that didn't get in. Uh, they did win their game in the first game in the tournament. They beat Texas Tech with Bob Knight. They had very comparable resumes and beat Texas Tech, and Tech got in in case they didn't. There was some heat on that one. So weird. Yep. Here's your question from all by station. As we continue, we're going to do a little more basketball, then we're going to get to football and get all of Ryan Gilbert's opinions on K-State football, both of them. First question is from Get Off the Schneid. Can we get an update on how on edge we should all be about Jerome Tang as the coaching carousel starts to turn? I think the season has benefited K-State in that argument. Um, but it's, you're, you're not out of the doghouse. I, I don't know where we're headed with this. I don't. I He really wants to stay. I can assure you that. He loves his place. He loves the fans. Uh, he loves the conference. This is something I find <clears throat> being missed in this discussion is the you know prestige of coaching in the big 12 within the industry is pretty significant and um i do find it very fascinating that once oklahoma is getting ready to leave the big 12 they might lose their coach porter porter Mosier is rumored to be headed to depaul uh going back to chicago uh depaul's been awful historically a great program um but been awful for many many years and it sounds like the alumni have had enough and they're ready to buy him out like seven million dollars worth for OU and bring him in but I gotta say this I, I think going to the SEC might have a role in that not because he's running in fear from how tough the SEC is if I'm not going to be in the big 12 I might as well go here maybe I'm overthinking it maybe it's just the simple fact that he doesn't believe you can ever achieve what you need to achieve at Oklahoma because NIL all goes to football that might be the truth of it he knows going to the SEC, trying to get NIL money away from football is going to be a challenge. And um, I, I just think <clears throat> I don't see Jerome Tang leaving this conference, and I also don't see him moving to any school within this conference. And you might bring up Baylor. I'm not even confident that would happen. Uh, he he doesn't just talk about the students and and you know demand excellence from the students in attendance and how how they behave because he likes to boss people around. He's not been exposed to this, and he he loves it. I, Baylor just doesn't have this kind of student support, and it is, plays a huge role in his affection for Manhattan, Kansas. This season's been good, right? If K-State <laughs> yeah. goes 13-5 and five and goes to the Elite Eight again, like, all right, you know, there you can be concerned that somebody else maybe wants to snag Jerome Tang, but, Guys, K-State struggled. I'm sure he would tell you that regardless of the obstacles and the adversity that this team has faced. They've struggled, all right? Drum Tang's stock in the coaching carousel world has gone down, right? But my only the, the only thing I'll say here, guys, did you hear his his comments about David Gasson, about him coming back? He, he made it very clear that he wants David Gasson to come back, and it was just like – Tang's here. He's here to stay. Like there was no like Tang wants to build a program. He wants to bring Gasson back. But the way that he said it, just reading kind of between the lines of the you know how he phrased it was like, yeah, I'm gonna like I'm I'm the coach of this program for the foreseeable future, right? I want this guy to come back and be in play for me, right? So that's a whole nother conversation. But just the way he phrased it in my eyes was like, yeah, he's Jerome Tang's not going anywhere, and I've said that all along, right? Now, obviously, if some other things happen off the court that are out of his control, right? And that continues to happen, then maybe fits. I mean, you know, that's, you know, this conversation get brought up, but if, as long as that stuff's buried and it's moved on from the past, right? I'm talking about Naquan Tomlin here, obviously. Um, then I think Tang's going to be here to stay. See, I think that if you're an athletic director at a power five or power six school, maybe not power six, because I, I couldn't see, and back, back to the Porter Mosier thing first, I don't think he would be leaving Oklahoma if it wasn't a school in Chicago. Oh, I agree with that. Like, I, I think that that's and it's a Big East program, right? It is a power. Six it's a it's job. a it's a power six job. It's awful. It's not a great job, but it's in what, Chicago. What a recruiting base! Like, I don't think that Porter Mosier would go to a lot of equal jobs or even other power conference jobs if it wasn't Chicago, because I think he does have a good thing going at Oklahoma. I don't think going to the SEC is necessarily a, a horrible thing for that job but I, I don't think porter leaves if it wasn't chicago area but i think if you back to my point if you are a power six power five administrator athletic director 
I think that you can see what happened at K State and understand, you know, hey, he lost this guy because the on campus administration didn't stick up for him. He left the program, left the university, went somewhere else, and that's the season that K State has had. Right. I think that you can see, you know, what K State is, you know, the sum of its parts. It's, um, and I don't think that's going to reflect negatively on Jerome Tang if during this coaching carousel something opens up. But really, the only job right now that he might leave for is Louisville. I mean, that's really the only marquee type of job. It's an ACC school. You know, I, I just think that, you know, being in the Big 12, um, you know, I think. It's a it's a it's a desirable place for any coach to be, regardless of which school you're at. There's going to be 16 teams here next year. They get better adding Arizona. I mean, this is the best conference in college basketball, and there's no argument anymore. The ACC has lost its luster from what it was. They're still probably the number two conference right now, but the Big 12 is the place to be if you're a coach and you're trying to prove it. Um, but I just I don't see any jobs right now opening. But then again, if Jerome Tang left, I wouldn't be shocked one bit either based on everything that's happened. And maybe everything has been resolved. Everything's OK. But, you know, a week from now, everything can change. Yeah. And another curveball in this whole discussion is there's a whole nother layer of realignment going on behind the scenes. And Brett Yormark, by his comments, has made it very clear the Big 12 is not done. And uh, one of the schools that would probably almost assuredly end up in the Big 12 is Louisville. Now, what's their interest level? I know they've kind of pivoted towards Scott Drew. I just don't see that happening. I don't see Scott Drew ever leaving Baylor. No. Uh, not with what he's done there, what it means to him, his um, really deep religious beliefs. I, I think he's exactly where he wants to be. Uh, but I can see Louisville really coming after Jerome Tang with more money than K-State could pay, and uh, that is an ongoing threat. Um, but I think now that the emotions have cooled from the entire blow-up, although the issues haven't, in my opinion, uh, I, I think uh, he's made it clear that uh, in, his preference is to stay, unless it becomes very clear he can't. He just doesn't want to. He can't. It's intolerable. It's kind of where Frank Martin got with John Curry. This is so intolerable. I'm going to leave a really good job and take a horrible job. Uh, and not that Louisville's a horrible job, but that's what Frank finally decided when a boss made his life miserable. And I don't think President Linton has continued to peck away like John Curry did with with Frank. I, I think they've kind of gone to their corners and and let the air come out of the situation. But I also uh, believe, and this is an interesting aside, that another media outlet is going to stir this all back up uh, here in the near future. Uh, I don't know what direction it'll go, um, but I think this topic will be in the headlines pretty soon again. Next question is from Buckeye Sager. Does Jerome Tang have turnover within his staff this off season? If so, are there any, do you have any thoughts on who it might be and who he may target? Now, Gills, we, I mean, Yurk has been pretty open about the fact he's he, he wants to become a head coach. He started attending Coach Tang's press conferences to hear how he handles it and, you know, hear what the questions are uh, so he could be prepared for that because, you know, he's kind of the, the uh, low key, incredibly bright mind on the staff. You know, he, he's not very, uh, Dream's got the whole showmanship going on and, uh, you know, Coach Perry has some X's and O's there. Not that uh, Yurik doesn't, but he wants to be a head coach. So maybe that's it. I, look, I don't think he's going to shove anyone out the door. I don't I don't think he's going to put a coach in the transfer portal. I just don't see that happening. Yeah. Yurik, I think, really is. I don't know if it'll happen this offseason or next offseason, but it's five years from now, assuming Jerome Tang is still the head coach, I'd be shocked if Yurik is still around. So this upcoming offseason, I'm not sure. But other than that, no, like I think Dream Dowling has hit his, you know, like he's here. I wouldn't say he's, I, I wouldn't call him Tang's like a right hand man, so to speak. But, you know, Rodney Perry, like, could, you know, there's a lot of, if you need somebody to come in and I'm not, maybe not train your guys with fundamentals, but give your guys a good system, schematics, and all that stuff, like Rodney Perry would be your guy. You know, he'll be getting some phone calls, right? But I don't, 
I don't see anybody else even leaving really besides Yurik. And then, I mean, you trickle down to guys like Winchester and Carpenter. Um, you know, I, I, to my knowledge, I think they're happy here. They love it, right? I mean, Austin just got – he just had his firstborn – uh, kid like a couple weeks ago and I know a dub is married he got engaged and so like I think that you know they're kind of along with Jerome Tang right but even if those guys do leave it's you know with all due respect it's it's not going to be something that you know is going to completely change your program so to speak so yeah other than yeah. Yurik though I, I think they're all kind of happy here and, and love it here if Yurik moves some of those guys will move with him and become coaches I mean they, they don't want to be you know analysts sure. and have other titles they want to be coach um, so I can see that happening, but maybe not after this year. We talk about Tang's value going down with the results of the season. Certainly hiring an assistant from K-State seems like a reach right now. Yeah, I think if Yurik was going to leave and get a head coaching job, I think that K-State would need a, you know, to at least look like a Sweet 16 yeah. team right now, like a four seed or higher if if any of the assistants were going to leave and, you know, improve their – their pay improve their job position whether it's you know a better assistant title a better you know be, becoming a head coach you know i think that k-state season just isn't good enough for that right. but you, i mean look at how k-state hired jerome tang i mean he wasn't the only assistant that you know baylor had that could become a head coach at the time but they were coming off that national championship national championship year the year before so, you know, there was a lot of, you know, good things that Baylor was still doing as they were advancing. So I just, you know, I, I don't think that those assistants are in a system or at least in a, a season right now where you would expect them to to exit and improve their position elsewhere. Agreed. I, I mean, the only thing, um, I lost my train of thought. Next Welcome question. Welcome to my life. Sorry, right? Yeah, literally, I don't even know what I was going to say. It was something about coaching, but. Oh, no. I, go on. Goodness gracious. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. I'm sorry. It's all right. Sleepy Gills. Uh, from <laughs> Gillum Fan 67663, uh, Lincoln Cure. We're moving to football now. Lincoln Cure said Texas A&M wasn't recruiting him, but right after Colin Klein arrived, they reached out. How do you think CK goes about recruiting against K-State? Oh, in an honorable way. I mean, he doesn't have a bad bone in his body. He's not going to trash K-State. He's just going to talk about the positives at AM. <clears throat> so, look, I, I mean, it's it's his job now to go get players. And if he has a player he knows is really good, he's going to recruit him. He works for someone else. I, I see no problem here. Um, but I think K-State's doing a good job with guys like Lincoln Keir and, of course, Avery, of selling them on the program, that what it's about and what it brings – to the table for them and what they would mean in the program as a Kansan. And I know he's kind of, it senses, it seems like he's down at K state and OU. He'll, he'll just be a guy at OU. I mean, yeah. I mean, if he's really good, they'll love him, but he's still from Kansas. Uh, he's not like a homegrown Oklahoma kid that fans would naturally migrate towards. So uh, I think they've done a good job. I, I do truly believe he's going to end up at Kansas state. I don't think it's a problem, and and I I have no problem with anything Collins doing. I mean, he's he's got to recruit players for his new team. Yeah, I mean, Lincoln Cure is a top fifty recruit in the class of twenty twenty five. Texas A and M, whether Colin Klein is there or not, would be dumb if they weren't trying to recruit a top fifty player in the country. Yep. I mean, look at it the other way. Let's say, I don't know, some K State assistant i'm trying to reverse engineer this to where some texas kid uh is now being recruited by a coach that was at texas and now he's at k-state like if he's a top 50 player and he's at you know close to where you're you know where it's reasonable for his family to travel and watch games and you know you're in a good conference and a good region you want to be in you know i think every kid you know every program you go look at lincoln cures offer list and you can see the number of playoff teams that were that were on there from this last year. I mean, you know, like like with all due respect to Colin Klein and Texas A&M, Texas A&M really isn't that great of a spot right now. It might it might be, but I think that's a good selling point for K-State. Hey, we won a Big 12 championship. We just won the Pop-Tarts Bowl. We're moving up. You know, K-State now doesn't have to worry about OU in Texas hogging the media perception in the conference. 
K-State can be the top dog right now as the Big 12 turns to 16 teams, adds Utah to probably be the, you know, the competitor there for that Big 12 championship game. K-State's in a really good place, and they're in a really good spot to sell in-state recruits, especially now that a lot of in-state recruits are getting national attention. You know, it's not just Lincoln Cure. There's five Kansans in the latest top 24-7 for the class of 2025. So, you know, look back three, four years ago, especially 10 years ago, you weren't seeing that type of, you know, athlete coming from the state of Kansas. You know, you got Avery Johnson a couple years ago. He's proven himself already in his short time that he's been here. He's going to be the future for at least the next couple of seasons, we think. You know, there's a lot of good things that K-State's doing right now, especially with these recruits and not just Lincoln Cure, but, you know, Andrew Babalola. Um, There's a lot of other guys that are local. And, and, you know, there's probably some Kansans on that list. If you take Lincoln Cure and you take a couple of the others, there's probably not room for them at certain positions. I mean, Kansas is becoming a much better and higher quality uh, recruiting ground, not just for K-State, but for the rest of the country and the power power teams. So, you know, I think that Colin Klein would not be doing his job well if he wasn't trying to recruit the best players in the country. Okay. Last question of the podcast from El Camino Cat. Are the proposals that are being leaked about the college football playoff serious or just P2 dreams? Why would the other seven conferences agree to such a tilted arrangement? Well, I think it's the big ask. You know, let's see if we can get them to give in to everything we want. And if not, then we'll leave. And we'll blame them because they didn't give us everything they want. I, I find the entire exercise fairly repulsive. And to to see the SEC and Big Ten just openly trying to destroy college football for their own favor. I saw an interview with Greg Sankey in which he blames uh, this whole situation on everyone else but him. What What a narcissistic jerk he has become. Uh, you know, I was trying to fix this years ago. Nobody would pay attention. Now here we are. We got to fix it. And I, and I was right the whole time. Uh, shut up, man. It just, he needs to be knocked down a couple pegs, uh, because he's, he's just turned into, uh, just, I, I'm sure the sec people love him, but it's just in, the whole entire conference has become narcissistic. They you literally think if they take a crap on the sidewalk, it's the best crap ever taken on a sidewalk. And probably hand form it into the SEC logo. Uh, I'm just I'm I'm tired of this whole thing, and it's very clear to me, El Camino, that they are attempting to make everyone else the bad guy, so that they have a reason to leave. And and people keep saying if they want to leave, they would. No, they want to have no other choice. You made it so impossible for us that we had to do this. It's you. That's a narcissistic relationship, and by definition, you put it all on the other people so that you don't have to feel any fault. Uh, I, I think this is a uh, just an awful thing they're attempting to do, and I, I look into the camera now and seriously ask Purdue and Kentucky and Indiana, uh, less so Missouri now, any school that takes great pride in basketball, from those two conferences, do you really want to do this? Because this road will lead to your exclusion from the NCAA tournament. That's the road you're on. You may not want it. In your scenario, in your brain, you think it's all going to work out in our favor, but you don't hold all the cards and everything. And those cards are going to get played against you. And as I mentioned um, today on my daily delivery, if there can be a basketball tournament in Las Vegas with prize money, why the hell wouldn't the football players demand prize money for the playoffs? They're, they're going to want that money. You want 58% of it, you two conference divided. Well, I can see the players arguing that 58% should be us. And if it's not us, we're not going to play in this. We'll play the regular season conference championships. But if you want to continue this, you got to pony up with a share of the prize money. What a weird place. Weird place. See, I think with the proposal 
what three or three auto bids for the Big Ten and the SEC, and then two each to the Big Twelve and ACC, and then one to a group of five, and then one to is it what two? What's my math? Three, three is six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one. So three at large bids. I think is it's a fourteen team playoff. I think is what's been proposed. Um, I think that it. I think it's the power conferences. When I say power, I mean the SEC and the Big Ten being the power brokers here. They want an additional slot for them, but giving the the one extra, you know, the Big 12 and the ACC having two each, I feel like it's almost a, a hedge for the, those two conferences saying, hey, you might not be around, but at least we'll give you a two. You know, you should be happy that you have two and you're surviving. I think that the Big 12 right now would be dumb to accept that because I think that they see, you know, I think all, you know, I'm going to put the Big 12 into the power three here. I think that everybody sees the ACC as the next one to fall apart. And I think that the Big 12 sees that they can great gain some teams and there's no need for them to accept two when if they can get some ACC teams, eventually, you know, they'll have more than than the two bids that they would need. You know, they'd probably have three, maybe even four you know, once once that happens. But, you know, if you're the ACC right now, let's say you're Boston College, you're Syracuse, you're Pitt, you know, you don't know what your home's going to be in the future. You might be inclined to say, yeah, we'll take the, the haircut. We'll take less money. We'll take the two automatic qualifiers because that's more than we're guaranteed right now. Um, you know, it, it comes from a position of, you know, I think that the ACC would be more likely to accept but i think that if you're clemson and florida state you're still trying to leave the conference you're trying to go elsewhere so i I think that the big 12 recognizes that and i don't think that they would want to agree to it i don't think any of the group of five teams would want to agree to it because the the three at large bids they're never going to be group of five you know weaker power Mm -hmm. um schools so you know i think it's kind of ridiculous right now how it's going but um, you know, if football breaks off, I don't see it. I don't see the Indianas. I don't see the Vanderbilts. I don't see the Purdue's of the world just being drug along to play, you know, to be the jobber schools in a power football league. I think that if the power league breaks out, I think that, you know, teams such as Utah, teams such as K-State, Oklahoma State, Iowa State, maybe Clemson, Florida State, Miami, you know, those types of teams, Virginia Tech, Virginia, maybe, you know, I think that there's better football schools in conferences that are not the Big Ten and the SEC right now that those two conferences would want to add to their quote unquote Super League. Because I think that at a certain point, the Big Ten and the SEC, I think they're going to turn against some of their own schools. Oh, absolutely. What are you doing for us? Why are we paying you a hundred million dollars to lose all the time? Someone's you don't, gotta lose though. Somebody has to lose all the time. And maybe the Big Ten, the SEC are smart enough to realize that. But at a certain point, Alabama, LSU, Michigan, Ohio State are not gonna want to drag along these other schools. <laughs> they should probably deserve more money than those schools that they're dragging along. So you know, I think it's it's sad where college football is going, but I think the reality is, eventually, you're going to cut some of these some of these teams in the Big Ten and the SEC that are comfortable. I don't think they're going to stick around. Gills, thoughts, nothing. Two words. I agree. Yeah, I agree. God, you're brilliant. I know. I don't know, I don't know where you got that, but that, I learned from you. Oh, no wonder it was brilliant. That's it for this edition of the Power Cat Podcast. Please make sure you're subscribing to gopowercat.com uh, and um, everything we do over there. The message boards are great. You just heard questions from some of the people there um, and how knowledgeable they are. It's a great community. Uh, starting 50% off on Wednesday, the Big 12 tournament starts for K-State on Wednesday. What a celebration that would be. Uh, the Fridge Wholesale Liquor will be open on Wednesday. All of this is real. It's real. Ryan Gilbert's imaginary. He is AI. 
Look at that hair. How could that hair be real? That hair is not real. Don't mush Whoa, it. Look at I made that. it what? worse. Just, wow. I, I need to turn off my Oh my, yeah, well, I ruined yeah. it. I look so weird. I look like Jimmy Neutron. This has been a GoPowerCat.com and Spirit Street production. Please support this show by subscribing to this YouTube channel or follow us on your favorite podcast platform.